Hi, everyone. Welcome to PCL Reads. Thanks for joining us tonight. We are so happy to have you here with our special author event with Doug Talmy. And we are virtually traveling to the Mount Pleasant Library today. Um, my name is Amy Rosa. I'm the manager at the Washington Park Library. And my co-partner, Lee Smith, is at his home library today at Mount Pleasant. So I'll let Lee do the introductions and tell you all about what's happening at Mount Pleasant this month. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm representing both PCL Reads and my home library this month. So uh, before I introduce Doug, I just want to highlight some exciting things happening here at Mount Pleasant Library. Uh, first and perhaps most exciting to any gardeners we might have in the audience, Mount Pleasant is one of three community libraries, the other two being Knight Memorial in Washington Park. Uh, that is part of the new Providence Seed Library. So there are a couple of great things that I really like about this initiative. Uh, one is that most of the seeds are heritage varieties, representing crops from underrepresented regions and cultures. And two, the seeds are fully searchable in our online catalog. So you just uh, Google Ocean State Libraries catalog and enter Providence Seed Library in the search bar and you can find all the seeds that we have. Uh, Mount Pleasant Library is also in the middle of our out door summer art series. So we started it a couple weeks ago with an author talk featuring Pro Professor Harp, uh, who also happens to be a blues harmonica player. So he played a few tunes on his harmonica for us. Uh, this Wednesday, uh, the series continues with an outdoor reception or really party uh, for, for the neighborhood artists that have exhibited their work um, really throughout the pandemic at the library. If you're interested in that event, you can get tickets at provcom provcomlib.org, P-R-O-V-C-O-M-L-I-B.org. In July, we'll invite another author, Jennifer Turner-Smith, to talk about her book, Child Bride. Now, it's won um, a bunch of awards, including uh, the year's best self-published fiction from the American Library Association's Black Caucus. And finally, the Leland Baker Quartet caps off the Outdoor Summer Arts series with a jazz concert. So if you're interested in either of those events, more information will be available on our website. Okay, so now I have the privilege of introducing Doug Talame. Uh, he's a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the uh, many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. Uh, you may have run, read one of his books, Bringing Nature Home revealed the unbreakable link between native plant species and wildlife, while Nature's Best Hope outlines a grassroots approach to conservation. Uh, so tonight, we'll be talking about his latest book, The Nature of Oaks, which highlights how oak trees sustain a complex and fascinating web of wildlife every month of the year. So Doug, you have the floor. After that. Uh, so, 18 years later, this is what the oak looked like. It was 45 feet tall, 47 inch circumference, canopy spread of 30 feet. And of course, it's still a baby, but it's a real tree. There are a number of, of creatures that depend on oaks, um, dozens of bird species, uh, rodents that you may not care about, but bears live in the big ones, uh, raccoons, possums, rat snakes like those holes, fence lizards. A uh, number of butterfly species specialize on oaks, but there are hundreds of species of moths that depend on oaks. And of course, you have their predators and parasites. You've got snip and gall wasps and june beetles and longhorn beetles, all kinds of beetles, weevils, myriad spiders, and dozens more species of arthropods that live in the oak litter underneath that oak. <clears throat> the problem is that that diverse web of life um, that depends on oaks, it's really a, it's a home to so many things goes unnoticed and unappreciated by most people who own an oak. They have no idea that these things are, are uh, happening right in their yard. And that is why I wrote this book, The Nature of Oaks. It's a month by month guide to the living things that are actually associated with uh, any oak tree. Uh, the idea was that uh, you'd be able to go out in your yard at any time of the year and uh, look for the things that I'm describing here. Develop a relationship with, with the oak in your yard. Realize it, that it's not just a tree, it's an entire community of living things. And of course, knowledge generates interest and interest generates compassion. And that's what we're looking for here. A little bit more compassion for the natural world that, that supports us. 
So before we start, let's uh, get a few facts out of the way. Oaks are in the genus Quercus. There are 91 species in North America, 435 species recognized globally now. Uh, the word Quercus comes from the Celtic quer, meaning fine, and quez, meaning tree. So oaks are fine trees, and indeed they are. There are four taxonomic sections, four primary taxonomic sections in North America. The white oak group uh, in the section Quercus, the red oak group in the Lobatie, the live oak group in the Varentes, those are oaks that never drop their leaves, and the protobalanus group, the Canyon Cranian uh, oak group in the west, it's a much smaller group. Oaks have very long life cycles. Uh, when their roots are able to uh, develop undisturbed and all the conditions are right, they can easily live 900 years. People say, I've got a 100-year oak in my yard, and they, they think that that's an old one. That's still a baby. They have 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis, and 300 years of decline. And in each one of those periods, they're develop, de delivering um, essential and unique ecological gifts to the land around them. Um, people ask, how old do oaks live? Well, this is the Middleton oak. Uh, it's a southern live oak in, I believe, Charleston, and it's believed to be 1,500 years old. That's supposed to be the oldest oak in the country, but they can really get up there. This is a picture of the Y oak. It's no longer with us, but it was in Y, Maryland. It was the largest white oak in the country, so they can get enormous, but one of the points I'm going to make tonight is that there are a number of small oaks, too, and that makes them uh, usable in even small landscapes. I want to focus on the fact that they have superior ecological function. They have the highest biodiversity value, meaning they are supporting more species of life than any other uh, tree genus. They're sequestering more carbon dioxide, pulling it out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, a good thing, stabilizing the soil um, very well, making the best leaf litter. In other words, promoting healthy watersheds. We'll talk about each one of these. We're going to start in October. People say, why you start in October? Well, October is when I got the idea to write this book, and there's nothing more to it than that. And I looked out the window, there's the oak we're going to focus on, and that's what it looked like in October. Of course, October is, is the month that you're going to recognize uh, acorns the most. The acorns are dropping uh, after they've been developing on the tree for uh, most of the summer. <clears throat> and a single oak can produce up to 3 million acorns in its lifetime. Uh, and acorns are valuable sources of food, so there's an awful lot of creatures that depend on them, uh, like a number of mice. I mentioned black bears. Not only do they live in large oaks, but they also eat those acorns. Of course, our squirrels do as well, those cute little deer that we love so much. Uh, a number of birds depend on acorns. Turkeys rely heavily on them. red belly woodpeckers, tip mice, towhees, uh, white-breasted nuthatches, flickers. And a number of ducks depend on, on uh, acorns as well, uh, particularly wood ducks for some reason. Any acorn that falls in the water, the ducks dive and get it, and they'll even come up on the land and scoop them up. A number of invertebrates depend on acorns as well. This is the acorn weevil larva. It is uh, squeezing its way out of an acorn. That's what the adult looks like. A, a group of moths called acorn moths that look almost identical, but it's a number of different species, uh, blastobastidae are very common in acorns. So you have all these things eating acorns. And at the end of the fall, you look under an oak tree, that's what it looks like. The acorns are all eaten or destroyed or stepped on. And you might wonder how do oaks actually ever reproduce with so many things eating their seeds. And this is where jays enter the story. And it's not just blue jays, it's jays all over the country. It's actually jays all over the world have a, a very uh, uh, interesting relationship with oaks. It's an ancient mutualism developed 65 million years ago in Southeast Asia. Both jays and oaks uh, evolved at the same time in the same place, and right away they, they hit it off. Oaks made those acorns, of course, which was a perfect food for, for jays, but jays delivered something to, uh, for oaks that uh, no other tree genus has, and that is it allows oaks to move farther and faster than, than other trees. And I will explain that in a second. Jays, of course, are uh, not just sitting there eating acorns. They store them for the winter. So they will, they'll take a, a, an acorn and they fly a good distance from the tree. And then they, they bury it. They don't cache their acorns in a big pile. They bury them individually. They just pick it up and then fly up to a mile 
from the parent tree. And that's the key. Other things that are dispersing acorns don't go nearly that far. And most of the other things dispersing acorns eat them on the spot. So they fly a mile, then they'll tap it below the surface of the ground. And uh, they're, they're very uh, cognizant of other jays in the area. Because if there is another jay in the area, they, um, they'll go sit on a branch for a while. They know that that jay is there to steal their acorn. So they wait a few minutes until the jay leaves. Then they go back, pick up the acorn, and move it to a different place because they steal from each other all the time. And then, of course, the idea is that in the wintertime, um, they will go back to where they buried these acorns and have something to eat. Uh, a single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns each fall. That's, that's 4,500 acorns for each jay that's out there. Uh, but they only remember where one in four of those acorns are. So that means a single jay is actually planting 3,360 oak trees each year. And that's what allows oaks to move so far. They move those acorns undisturbed without wrecking them, bury them, they're planting them, and then they forget where they are. So they're, they're excellent gardeners. And it's not just blue jays, it's the scrub jay from uh, Oregon. Jays all over the country have very similar relationship. Okay, November. Now, this is when you might uh, recognize that uh, the year was either a good year for acorns or a very bad year for acorns. There's not too many in between years. Oaks either make a lot of acorns or they make very, very few. And if they make a lot, it's called a mast year. It's typically all the members of a particular group, like the white oak group or the red oak group, will get together and decide to make their acorns at the same time. Uh, and it's such a curious uh, behavior in terms of, of fruiting that uh, there are a number of hypotheses to try to explain. Why do oaks do that? Why don't they make about the same number of acorns every year? Uh, it could be from predator satiation, predator reduction, or improving pollination or energy partitioning. And we'll talk about each one of those. Predator satiation, this is the acorn weevil larva outside of an acorn, but they can be so numerous. They can, they can uh, attack more than 90% of the acorns on a tree. Uh, that's when their population coincide, when it, when it regulates itself at about the number of acorns that are being made. So one of the, the uh, explanations for masting is that they make so many acorns, there's not enough acorn weevils to attack them. There's not enough squirrels to eat them all. There's not enough turkeys, not enough uh, acorn predators. Um, so they're swamping the population of all these things that are eating acorns. And that allows some of those acorns to make it through to actually germination. Predator reduction is similar. When you have a mast year and things like squirrels and mice um, depend on those, those uh, acorns, their populations actually explode. So then the next year, you got a lot of squirrels and a lot of mice and a lot of turkeys, and, but you don't have a lot of acorns. So then the populations crash. Remember, there's not a mast year every single year. Uh, and that crashing of the population allows oaks in the next couple of years to mast again without too many predators around. Improved pollination, oaks are wind pollinated. And if they all release their pollen uh, at the same time, there's a much better chance that the pollination will be successful because there's so much pollen on the wind. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that oaks can cause uh, allergies for some people. It's usually just maybe a week during the year uh, and oaks are so valuable, it's worth putting up with it. But they do release a lot of pollen. And when they have a mast year, if they all do it at once, um, the chances that pollination will be successful are much greater. And then finally, masting might be uh, a matter of energy allocation. There never seems to be enough energy around to grow and make acorns at the same time. So some years they make very few acorns and put a lot of energy into growth. Other years they put almost all their energy into acorns and very little in, into growth, all because there's simply not enough energy to go around. Okay, December, oh, by the way, um, those are four hypotheses and they're not mutually exclusive. They all could be happening at the same time. Now in December, you might recognize that um, not all of your oaks have dropped their leaves, uh, particularly members of the white oak group hang on to leaves uh, and they do it particularly on the lower branches, particularly in younger trees. Uh, and that's a condition called marcescence. Another curious behavior of oaks, why don't they drop their leaves like other deciduous trees? Well, again, 
you know, ecologists sit there and make make uh, hypotheses, and and this is the one that explains mar marcescence. It wasn't that long ago uh, when there were very large mammals, many of them browsers. Uh, in North America, actually all over the world. This is the group of large mammals that occurred just in Mexico. It included three species of mammoths. It include, included the uh, giant sloth that could reach up 18 feet. Um, camels, horses, of course, evolved in North America. There used to be 40 species of rhinoceros. All of these guys used to browse just the way deer do now, which means they're, they're biting off the growing tips of next year's foliage on branches. Uh, and if you surround your, your uh, next year's bud with the dead leaves from the previous year, uh, it makes what could be a very tasty meal something that's not so tasty at all. You're getting a mouthful of dead leaves. Uh, and that's the explanation for why, um, why the oaks are hanging onto their leaves, is to keep these old browsers from, from picking off those, those buds. Uh, and the fact that that's just on the younger or the, the lower branches that the leaves are retained supports this hypothesis. If you look at your oaks where they're, they're, um, they have marcescent leaves, it goes up about 18 feet and then it stops. There's no marcescence at the top because nothing could reach up that high. Um, another uh, thing is when you're when you're trying to eat uh, the buds with uh, dead leaves around it, it's very difficult to do it quietly because those leaves are going to rustle. And there are a lot of predators around the saber tooth tiger and giant cave lion and all those guys uh, that were looking for these browsers. So uh, maybe they had to, to eat more quietly and they just focused on other plants. The fact that marcescence exists, though, gives oaks a deciduous tree a landscaping attribute that most deciduous trees don't have. And that is they can be used as screens, particularly when they're, they're young and block the view even in the winter time. Okay, speaking of the winter time, let's move on to January. Um, January, of course, is, is cold. It's most of us are not outside looking for wildlife. But if you do go outside, you look up into the, what looks like uh, barren branches, certainly no leaves there and nothing, nothing happening up there, but you might notice something is happening. There are birds that are foraging on those, those uh, branches. Things like the golden crown kinglet, um, our chickadees, our titmice. Chickadees and titmice, of course, are at our feeders eating seeds, but only 50% of their diet is, is seed. The other 50% is insects. And golden crown kinglets don't eat any seeds. They're 100% insectivores. They should have migrated because who, who would think there's enough insects around to keep these guys going? Well, Bern Heinrich was wondering about this. Um, he's the one that writes the, the little column in uh, Natural History Magazine. Uh, he, he wondered about it so much that he got a bunch of kinglets in Maine and uh, actually cut them open, looked in their crops and found that they were full of caterpillars in Maine in January. So the next question is, where the heck are they getting caterpillars? Uh, well, if you look carefully at your oak branches, you will see there are caterpillars that are just hanging out there all winter long. Many of them, well, all of them look like sticks. They're all motionless. They're not eating anything. Uh, and uh, that is what those, those birds are after, keeps them alive. Uh, when it gets very cold, which is frequently, these caterpillars have antifreeze proteins in their cells that keep the cells from bursting. Um, and when it gets cold, they shrink a little bit. And then when it gets a little bit warmer, they expand a little bit, but they're, they're just hanging out. Uh, and they're supplying a, just a crucial uh, source of, of protein and fat for these, these birds during the winter time. Why would a caterpillar do this though? And the caterpillars really aren't interested in feeding, feeding birds. They wanna make it through uh, and, and, and lay their own eggs as an adult. And the only guess that we have is that if you spend the winter as a caterpillar, when the new leaves come out, you are ready to go. If you spend the winter as an egg, uh, you've got to hatch and you're very tiny, you can't compete very well. If you spend the winter as an adult, you've got to mate and lay eggs uh, and then hatch. Um, so if you spend the winter as a mid-grown larva, you are ready to eat the leaves as soon as they expand. It gives you a, a leg up on everything else that's trying to compete for those same leaves. February, February is the, the uh, quietest month 
uh, on your, your oak tree. So it's a good time to look at a number of landscaping myths that surround the use of oaks. And there are a number of them. Because uh, I hear people say all the time, well, I'm, I'm not going to plant an oak because they're too expensive. They grow too slowly. They get too big uh, for, for uh, use on, on a small lot. And if they do uh, get big, they're gonna fall over and crush my house or my car. They're gonna lift up my sidewalk. These are, these are all things we want to avoid. How many of them are actually true? Well, let's look at the first one. Are oaks too expensive? Well, they are too expensive if you insist on instant gratification by trying to plant a large oak uh, because they'll charge you up to $3,000 for a large oak. Uh, but I, I, I strongly recommend against that. Uh, large oaks are grown in two ways. They're grown in pots, which is uh, an extreme no-no because when you take the plant out of the pot, uh, what do you think is gonna happen to the roots? Those are seriously root bound. Oaks have huge root systems and uh, in a pot, they just go around and around and around. And, and uh, if, if you plant that and they, the, roots con oaks, the roots continue to grow, they will strangle each other and eventually kill the tree. So never buy a large tree in a pot. It's, uh, it's a very bad deal. The other way is to uh, plant them or sell them as bald and burlap trees. And this is a case where the roots are not um, root bound, but they're chopped off. In order to move a tree this size, you have to root prune it to the point where they, uh, they all fit in this, this uh, burlap. And you might think, well, that's a big ball and it is heavy, but it's, it's nothing compared to the roots that they had to chop off. So look at these guys, they're not very happy. Um, and if you plant this tree, it's got a 50% chance of dying. If it doesn't die, it will then spend the next decade trying to rebuild its root system. In other words, it's not going to grow at all. So your, your uh, quest for instant gratification um, is, is going to, uh, you're not going to be satisfied with it. If you actually plant an acorn, the same day you plant one of these, these bald and burlap big trees, the acorn will germinate, grow roots, and grow faster and actually pass this tree by the end of that, that decade. Um, and, and it will be a much healthier tree. So try to plant an oak as small as you can. This is a great size to plant an oak, and it will be a much healthier specimen. The reason it's hard to get trees this, this big, of course, is that nurseries can't charge very much for them. Um, so uh, you want a healthy tree or do you want to pay a lot of money for a tree? You can, you can decide. What about uh, oaks growing slowly though? Now we talked about uh, their reputation right after you plant them, that they just sit there for a while making huge root systems. Uh, but um, they certainly do have that, that reputation. We're gonna have a race between this oak, that's the, the, the one I planted from an acorn, um, it's now grown past the, the point where I need to have a deer cage around it. This is my little friend, Bella. She's two years old. And we're going to have a race between Bella and, and this oak. Um, so the oak is six years old here. It's seven years old. Eight, nine, ten. Look how fast that oak is growing. Bella's growing too, but she's not keeping up. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. 18, 19, and here's 2020 with Bella with her mask on. Um, the oak has clearly won. This is a white oak, folks, the ones that are supposed to grow really, really slowly. Uh, if you let them get going with a good root mass, they grow as fast as anything else. So let's not, let's not buy into that myth. You also don't have to wait for your oaks to be large before they contribute ecologically to your landscape. And, and if your goal is to, is to restore the ecological integrity of your property, even a young oak will do that. Here's a pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves and here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. Why is that important? Because caterpillars are the, the, um, they're the, the, the basis of the terrestrial food web. They're transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant plant eater. So the more caterpillars you have in a landscape, the more birds you have, the more biodiversity you have. It's a very easy way to measure your success at ecological restoration. Are oaks too large to use in small yards? Well, you know, there's countless examples of large oaks in small yards. So obviously it can happen. Um, these are two red oaks in a very small yard. I'm sure they were planted the same time this house was built well over a hundred years ago. Uh, and you're not gonna find anybody who would recognize that you plant a red oak in a space that way. But um, in the meantime, these guys have shaded that house for uh, you know more than a century. 
dropping the temperature in the summertime by 10 degrees, protecting it in the wintertime. Um, notice they haven't lifted up any hardscape either. This is a very large uh, oak. I think it's a red oak next to a very large church. Uh, and fortunately, they didn't chop it down when they when they built the church. Um, so, you know, it can be done, but I do, I do get it that people are not going to recommend that. What I want to focus on here is that you have a number of small oak options, many more in the west, but in the east, dwarf chestnut oak, uh, Quercus prinoides, and more and more people are starting to uh, carry that. The Georgia oak, Georgia, uh, Quercus uh, georgiana, has been in the industry in and out. Um, dwarf live oak is an important one as you move further south those massive oaks with all the, the Spanish moss hanging from them. There's a dwarf variety. Um, so we need to get more of these small guys into the industry. The dwarf chestnut oak makes acorns when it's five feet tall. I've got one in my property. Actually, there it is right there. Um, so you don't have these massive things in your yard and you still get all the ecological benefits we're going to talk about. Another way to get a small oak is through uh, coppicing. So you, you uh, plant an oak and let it grow until it's a diameter of three or four inches, and then you chop it off at the base. Uh, and what will come back is, is a bush. And eventually they'll get tall and you have to chop them off again. But this is what uh, um, coppicing is. Uh, it used to be a common forestry pra practice back in the old days. They used coppice material for lots of things. But it's a great way to get the ecological value of an oak tree in your yard without having a massive plant. Will oaks crush your houses? Um, well, they could. Uh, it all depends on how we, we plant them. And of course, with the media today, if an oak falls or a big tree falls on, on a house or a car anywhere, we hear about it. It makes it sound like it's happening every day, everywhere. Um, the reason these oaks are so vulnerable or trees are so vulnerable is that we plant them all as specimen trees. We don't want them near another tree. So you can't crowd it. You want it to, to reach its full splendor. But that's not the way trees grow in a forest. So when they're isolated like this, their, their roots are not able to interlock with the roots of anything else. If you get a uh, really wet period, I hear you had a lot of rain today, and then you get a big wind, phew, they're top heavy, over they go. This is the way trees grow in a forest. Their roots are all interlocked together in a matrix. It's almost impossible to grow them over. You can see this in a stream cut. Here's one, two, three, four different trees. Uh, believe me, you don't, you don't blow those trees over. If you have a tornado, it can snap them off, but there is no landscaping trick that's going to protect you from a tornado. But you can protect yourself from blowdowns by planting uh, tree, tree groves. So instead of single isolated trees like this, consider, consider little groves. They, the smallest grove you can have is two trees, but three is probably a little bit better. These are two big white oaks that uh, grew naturally. Nobody, nobody planted them. They're, uh, uh, the centers are about you know, five feet apart. And I'm sure they were here when they put this, this road in. Neither one of them will reach the full splendor that it would reach if it were isolated. So you view them as a, uh, a collective group. Here's a... Uh, it's called the Three Sisters in Connecticut, uh, another, another group of, of trees where the roots are totally locked in and extremely stable. This is a, uh, believe it, it's, it's a planned garden at Mount Cuba Center in uh, Hocassin, Delaware. It's a part of a DuPont estate. There's a little hardscape down there. These are rhododendrons, just to give you an idea of the size of this planting. There's a big red oak back here. These are hemlocks. They were all planned. They were all planted. Their roots are all interlocked. It looks extremely natural. It's ex extremely diverse and it's extremely stable. So, so think about uh, tree groves and that will stabilize your, your big trees in your yard. Will your oak lift up your sidewalk or your hardscape? Um, you know, sometimes it will. It depends on the, on the growing conditions. First of all, some oaks are more shallowly rooted than others. Willow oaks, for example, can, the roots can be fairly shallow. But any oak will grow along the surface if you're growing it on bedrock or if you're growing it on an agricultural pan where you only have six inches of soil and then it's impenetrable. Uh, but if you have a, a decent growing condition, the oaks can, can uh, send their roots deep. This is a pin oak, no lifting up here. These are two big red oaks at the University of Delaware. I mean, look at that. That's a big tree uh, with roots that are going right under the, the uh, street and right next to the curb, no lift up at all. So it's not inevitable that a big tree is going to destroy your hardscape. Okay, on to March. The leaves are finally uh, dropping. The marcescence is starting to, to end. Um, let's talk about leaves for, for a while. Now the leaves are, are hitting the ground. 
oaks make a lot of leaves and a mature oak there can be 700,000 leaves and if you line them all up next to each other that will cover four tennis courts. There's a tremendous amount of diversity in oak leaf shape and leaf size, depending on the species, even depending on uh, whether it's a juvenile or an adult. So for example, this leaf and that leaf came from the same tree. Um, that's a juvenile leaf and that's a mature leaf. Some oak leaves look like holly leaves, some just look like willow leaves. So tremendous amount of diversity in oak leaves. When they fall, uh, I, I made the statement that they make the best leaf litter. I said that because they make the longest lived leaf litter. Leaf litter is a, an essential component of our uh, forest floor ecosystem. It's the blanket that covers uh, the forest floor and maintains moisture level. Of course, leaves contain the nutrients that that tree used that previous year. Uh, and they've got to return those nutrients to the soil. So the uh, oak leaf litter is loaded with what we call detritivores, the things that eat dead leaves and release the nutrients into the soil. If you don't do that, you're, you're leaching nutrients from your, your yard every single year. That's when we get into crazy fertilization regimes. We, we rake up our leaves and throw them out. Uh, it's all very artificial and it doesn't work nearly as well as if we let those leaves break down right where they are. Um, by the way, this, this reminds me, a lot of people don't want to leave uh, oak leaves in their beds because uh, they think it'll, it'll smother the growth of all of their, their perennials and annuals. Um, this fern garden here shows very clearly it doesn't. They come right up through there. Now, I'm not talking about piling five feet of leaves uh, on, your, on your ground because that will smother things, but a normal layer of, of uh, leaf fall is normal and the plants are very good at getting through them. I've got, I've got pictures, I should include them here, of my, my flocks. Uh, Phlox paniculata, every delicate plant, pushing right through the, the oak leaves under my oak tree without having removed any of them. But what I want to talk about is all the species that live underground uh, in the first few inches of the soil when it's protected with healthy leaf litter. There are more species of animals uh, in a square meter under the ground, well, more species under the ground than on top of the ground. In a single square meter uh, of, of um, healthy forest floor, you can have 250,000 mites. You can have 100,000 springtails. This is a, a, uh, one of the columbulins, a smithurid columbulin. That's a type of springtail. 90,000 proturans, those are very primitive insects that you probably need a microscope to see. And over a million nematodes, you definitely need a microscope to see them all in one square meter. So it's teeming with life. And those guys are uh, either breaking down that leaf litter um, or eating the algae and fungi that are, are also breaking it down, or they're predators of the, the detritivores that are there. There are some specialist uh, butterflies like the uh, banded hair streak whose caterpillar develops on oak leaf litter like that. Imagine looking for a caterpillar in, in uh, oak leaf litter like that. I have never found a banded uh, hair streak caterpillar, but they're, they're down there. They're, they're not very uncommon as adults. Uh, and there are 70 species of moths, we call them litter moths, that develop on leaf litter. Uh, and those are the ones when you walk through the woods or you kick them up um, they're all over our property because we keep all of our leaves. This is the ambiguous litter moth, the dark spotted palthus. Again, many, many species of these that are essential components of that detritivore community. Then you have the predators that are eating all those guys. Uh, ground beetles are uh, the most common ones, but there's certainly a lot of spiders and other things that are depending on all of that protein. Very vibrant community. Um, another thing, the, the fact that oak leaves last three years is critically important because so many other types of leaves don't. Things like maple leaves or tulip tree uh, leaves or birch leaves, they, they don't even make it through the first summer. They break down so quickly that that, re that leaves, if that's all you have uh, on your property, that leaves bare soil. And bare soil is definitely a no-no. All of the, the living things I just described depend on that blanket to protect them uh, all, all year long. And that's why oak leaves are superior. Okay, April, time for the buds to break. Uh, it's, it's when um, life really starts to, to jump out on your oak. And it's also the time of year that you get the chance to see one of the most ephemeral biological interactions anywhere on the planet. It lasts about five minutes every year. And I'm talking about the relationship between cynipid gall wasps and the buds in which they lay their eggs. These are cynipid gall wasps. That's the female. That little thing right there is her ovipositor. She's laying an egg in this expanding oak bud. This is a male 
who is riding her, he hopes to mate with her as soon as she finishes laying that egg uh, so that the next time she lays an egg, she will use his sperm. This is another male who hopes to dislodge this guy. He's probably not going to be able to do it. Um, but what she's doing is she's laying her egg in this expanded bud. And the, the cells in this bud are called meristematic tissues. They're, think of them as stem cells uh, where they're undifferentiated. They can turn into lots of different things. Uh, so when she's laying her egg, she's also injecting plant hormones that manipulate the, the growth of those cells into a species-specific structure that we call a gall. So here's a uh, female... Oh, yeah, I checked one uh, this, this year. She was uh, laying an egg in this bud, and that is the gall that resulted. I put a little string around it so I could follow it. Um, and inside that gall is a developing gall wasp. There are 5,000 species of cynipid gallers around the world. Most of them are associated with oaks. A single oak tree can support 70 different species of, of gallers. Uh, another interesting thing is that most of these galls are hollow. This is the apple oak gall. It's uh, one of our biggest galls. And if you cut it open, you'll see that again, it's hollow. There are these little rays, but the galler itself is in a capsule right in the center there. And you've got all this space, which seems wasted. Why do you have a big gall with a bunch of air there and the galler is a tiny little thing in the center? Well, there's a good reason for it. And that is that gallers, cynipid gall wasps have more enemies, more um, little wasps called parasitoids that lay their eggs in the galler with this long ovipositor and develop inside the, the gall wasp. So uh, the space, this space here is designed to keep the long ovipositors of those gall uh, wasp parasitoids from reaching the center, being able to parasitize the, the galler. There's a little period in the beginning when this is growing rapidly where they, those ovipositors can reach it, but it's a very short period. And if, they, uh, if the galler escapes during that period, then it's safe because of this space. Oh, this is a pterimid wasp. It's just one of the species of parasitoids that uh, hit, hit gallers. If you uh, bring a gall in and rear it out, simply put it in a jar and wait to see what comes out, more often than not, you're going to get one of these parasitoids rather than a galler because they're so, the gallers are so heavily hit with these guys. Gall diversity is fantastic. Um, I'll just show you a few, few pictures. This is one of the prettier ones. Uh, West of the Rockies, there are 536 species of plant galls, and most of those are cynipid gall wasps on oaks. Um, some of them uh, are very simple, just little, little uh, round guys. Some of them are hairy, um, more of the round guys. Some of them look like diseases. This is a number of one, two, three, four, five, six. Those are, there's a little gall wasp in each one of those. Um, some of them look I don't know, like decorations of a spider hiding out down there. This is uh, the large uh, gall that's on uh, Quercus gariana, the Oregon oak out west, can be very common. Some look like pottery, some look like, oh, that's another round guys there. Some look like brown uh, brains. This brown guy does have an interesting story though. There's the hole, what happens, that's when the, when the galler actually leaves the gall, leaves a hole here. It turns out that much of, of human recorded history has depended on an ink that was made from uh, the oak bullet gall, this gall right here. Uh, a long time ago, we figured out if you grind this up into a powder and add certain chemicals, it produces a black uh, ink that has recorded our history. The Bible was written with gall ink. The Magna Carta was written with gall ink. The Declaration of Independence was written with gall ink. We wrote everything with gall ink uh, until we invented a more sophisticated chemistry very, very recently. So there's a uh, historical uh, connection between humans and, and galls that most people don't realize. Um, after the marcescent leaves drop in April, that's a good time to hunt for polyphemus cocoons. This is the polyphemus cocoon. Polyphemus moths are one of the giant silk moths and they spend the winter suspended from cocoons hanging from uh, an oak, oak branch. They, they feed on oaks. And when the leaves are, are around the, that bed, bud, you, don't, you can't see these guys. But once they drop, then you can find them. They're, they're large and they're silvery. That's what the caterpillar looks like. It's also large. 
but it's green, eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon, then it emerges as an, an adult, one of our largest uh, giant silk moths. It's always a great find to find a polyphemus moth because every year there's fewer of them, particularly in New England. New England's losing its, its giant silk moths uh, very quickly. Um, the uh, royal walnut moth is already extirpated from, from New England. Okay, May is May is when you get the full leaf expansion uh, on your oak. And this is really when that new biological year begins in, in earnest. <clears throat> it's also uh, the time of year that uh, all the spring migrants come, all those birds. And that's because in, this, in, in May, when you have the expansion of all those oak leaves, that's followed very rapidly by the production of the caterpillars that eat those leaves. And the caterpillars that eat those leaves are the main food of migrating birds and also of birds that are reproducing. So we're talking about spring migration. This is a magnolia warbler, uh, great in, in one of my uh, willow oaks. Birders know that if you're gonna look for warblers, you go to oaks to look for warblers. This is a Blackburnian uh, warbler in another one of my, my oaks. I had a, Chris, uh, a graduate student it was several years ago now, uh, Christy Beal, who looked at the amount of time warblers spent foraging in different plant families. So this is the Fagaceae, that's where the oaks are. Fagaceae also com contains uh, American chestnut and beeches. But in her, her studies, uh, the only Fagaceae she looked at were oaks. There weren't any chestnuts or beeches. She was in uh, looking at large trees and cemeteries. Uh, so obviously birds, the, the, the warblers are spending uh, most of their time in oaks. Why? Because that's where most of the food is. They're there to get the caterpillars to fuel their migration, or if they stay around to reproduce, it, it fuels their reproduction. Things like the purple crested slug or the uh, buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, double line prominent, white dotted prominent, the checkered fringe prominent, the laugher. The lace cap caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the uh, variable oak leaf caterpillar, the banded tussock moth, the hickory tussock moth, the red line panapoda, the yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa, the unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug, they're called slug moths because the head is tucked up underneath, not because they're really slugs. The pink striped oak worm, the streak dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the spiny oak slug, uh, the uh, spun glass slug, which is my favorite caterpillar by far, just because it's so very, very cool looking. Um, and hundreds more, literally hundreds more are on uh, oaks in, in this area. So this is what our house looks like today. This is my Zoom room, by the way. I'm sitting up in that window. We're traditional, we've got lawn, but I put a lot of plants back. Many of them are oaks. The oak that we're following is over here. You can't see it right now. And I started taking a picture of every species of moth that have, has come and started to make a living off our property. Uh, and I am now up to, I've been doing it for four years, but I'm up to 1,090. I got another one today. So 1,090 species of moths in my yard and 30% of them use oaks. And that's why I call oaks keystone species. Remember what a keystone is. This is the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of that arch. If you take that stone out, the arch will collapse. Well, I call them keystone species because they're making most of the food. If we take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses and you don't have a viable food web. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those, those food webs. So think of the, let's say you're building an ecological house in your, in your yard. The keystone plants are the two by fours of that house. They are essential but they're not the only thing the house is gonna be built up. You don't build a house out of wallpapers. You need those, those solid two by fours to hold it up. Uh, and oaks are the number one keystone plant in 84% of the counties of North America. In the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars, over 950 species. I think it's 952 as of today nationwide. There is no other plant genus that comes close to that. So oaks are enormously important in terms of transferring energy from plants supporting the animals to transfer the energy from plants to um, other, particularly vertebrates. Vertebrates don't eat plants most for the most part. They eat those caterpillars that ate plants. 
So having a plant that produces all those caterpillars is really, really important. Okay, June. This year, June is cicada month. Um, now, I know uh, you're not, you don't have the, the brood 10 up there, but we do this year. Where it's the periodical cicada. The brood 10 is a 17-year uh, cicada. There's also a 13-year brood. This is what they look like. They're a little bit smaller than the annual cicadas we, we get in, in uh, July, but they come out by, uh, I guess, by the billions. There's, there's a lot of them. Um, the media has made a big deal out of this. They call it, oh, it's a terrible scourge and we should all fear it. We have to run and hide in our houses. Uh, they're going to be deafening. The same people that spend their day weed whacking and mowing complain about uh, cicada noise. Um, and it's always talked about as an invasion. It's, it's just another attempt by the media to um, discuss nature as if it's something we all need to fear. It's none of those things. It's one of the most fantastic biological events that you'll ever be privileged to, to watch. They do come out in great numbers when you have a successful population. Uh, they crawl out of the ground, they leave little holes, which by the way, aerates your soil. Uh, it's something that, that uh, most soils appreciate. And then, then they're there in big numbers. This is, this is something that, that was great. Uh, it happened up here in, in Newark, Delaware. I actually saw some at my house. This is the Mississippi kite. This is a bird that uh, has, comes up in groups, flies over a thousand miles to eat these cicadas. That's how important a food source uh, it, it is. Otherwise they don't come. And this is the, the general life cycle. The nymph crawls out of the ground at night. Then it emerges as uh, an adult, hasn't expanded its wings yet. It does expand its wing, takes hours for the, the exoskeleton to tan to harden up, uh, but finally it does, and then they can fly away and start their short life. Uh, the short life is, is uh, it's com comprised of, of simply the male sitting on a, a branch and, and singing. He's singing by, um, he's got a structure that looks like our eardrum. Uh, it's an it's a open space with a tympanum stretched across it, and he clicks that back and forth, just like a Coke can. If you're clicking it, click, 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 click. But he does it a couple, I don't know, a couple hundred times a second. And it produces a buzz. And the females hear that buzz and they judge which male is buzzing the loudest and they fly to the male that is buzzing the loudest. Then they mate. Then the female lays eggs. This is her ovipositor. She's inserted it into the twigs and she lays a series of, of eggs. It takes her about five minutes per egg. She sinks it deep in there and leaves these scars. The egg is now in here and will stay there up to six weeks and then finally hatch and the little guys parachute to the ground, tunnel underground, and then uh, develop on, on tree roots. They really like oaks. They get on other trees, but they, they prefer oaks. And then the, then the cicadas die. So it'll be over soon um, and we won't see them for another 17 years. I will be 87 when I see my next periodical cicada. So I'm trying to take full advantage of it right now. Why should they stay underground 17 years? Well, it's the same explanation that um, is offered for oak mass. They're trying to uh, satiate the predators. A lot of things eat cicadas, including those Mississippi kites that are flying up uh, from, from Mississippi. Uh, but there are never enough things around to eat the cicadas. No population can stabilize around something that emerges once every 17 years. So the, the, the birds and the squirrels and all those things that are eating cicadas get full and then the cicadas that aren't eaten can successfully reproduce. Yeah, there's a squirrel in my front yard, but he, you know, he eats two or three and he's full. That's, that's the end of that. Uh, once they lay their eggs inside the, uh, the twigs, it, it causes flagging. It, the branch actually dies from the point the egg was, was laid out. Uh, and some people get upset about that, but just consider it nature's pruners and it only happens once every 17 years. Okay, July. This is when the night chorus begins. If anybody's ever camped in July uh, and, and August, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Katie Dids and their night song. You know, once upon a time, there was a young woman named Katie. And she fell in love with a very handsome young man, but alas, he did not share her feelings and he married another. Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the trees were watching that night. And each summer they solved the mystery by singing, Katie did, Katie did. Hope you can hear that. 
that's the sound of, of uh, one of the katydids. The males, uh, it's called stridulation. They raise their, their first pair of wings. There's a scraper and a file here and they rub them back and forth and it produces that sound. Each species has uh, a species specific sound, but when you get thousands of them singing in your oak canopy at night, um, it, it is, it's pretty loud, but it's a, you know, I, I camped a lot when I was young and it's a, a very comforting sound to me bring back lots of very pleasant memories. There are four species of katydids that frequent oak forests. Um, this is one of them as a nymph. The ovipositor has already uh, developed, but the wings aren't complete yet. The next molt should be a complete adult. That's what she looks like. Uh, that spatula shaped ovipositor helps lay very flat eggs. It glues them to a twig like that. These guys have already hatched, but if you ever find these things on a twig, now you know what they are. Those are katydid eggs. Uh, Katie did continue to sing into August, but uh, what's happening in August is oak leaves that are always pretty tough are getting really tough by August time. They're, they're full of tannins, they're full of lignans, and they get stiff as boards. And that's a very good defense against the things that want to eat oak leaves. And there are a number of things that eat oaks, as we already pointed out. Uh, what's curious is that uh, there's still a lot of uh, insects, particularly caterpillars, that eat oak leaves in August. And this is how they get around it. The ones that do um, use a couple of strategies. One is they are gregarious. They all feed together. This is the yellow neck caterpillar and many mouths can make those leaves uh, less, less tough when they're all working together on it. This is what they look like um, as, uh, when, they're, when they're almost fully grown. Uh, and they can eat a, a good amount of, of leaf material and people see a branch being stripped and again, they get upset. Uh, this is the yellow neck caterpillar. I mean, the uh, uh, orange humped uh, oakworm doing the same thing, the pink striped oakworm doing the same thing. A lot of things feed gregariously. There were 115 yellow neck caterpillars on this tree just before I took this picture. But when you stand back from the tree, you can't see any of them. You can't see the branch they were feeding on. They're not hurting the tree at all. So don't be upset that you've got caterpillars eating your trees. They're adapted to handling that amount of herbivory and you're producing a lot of bird food. There's a woman in uh, New Orleans, Tammany Baum Garden, who suggests we all take the, you, we all practice the 10 step program. Take 10 steps back from your trees and all of your insect problems disappear. Don't grab the, the spray can because then you get on the insecticide treadmill, you start killing all the natural enemies of those caterpillars and then you really do have problems. Another strategy is to not eat the leaf directly but to mine it. The tough parts are the cuticle, the uh, top part of the leaf and the bottom part of the leaf, the lower and upper uh, epidermis. The palisade mesophyll, the parenchymal cells inside are still very soft. That's where all the nutrition is. And if you get skinny enough as a caterpillar, you can actually mine between the top and, and bottom layers of the leaf. This is a serpentine mine. Um, the egg was laid here and the caterpillar developed the little black line in the middle here is the frass, uh, the little poops of that caterpillar. And then it finished eating here, pupated. Uh, this is a blotch mine and there, if you look very carefully, you can see the caterpillar developing. Here it is backlit, that's the caterpillar in there. And it simply spins in a circle and leaves its frass all over the place. That's what a uh, uh, leaf miner looks like, not much like a caterpillar at all. They're very, very skinny as you can imagine. But when they come out as, as moths, they look like regular moths. They're small, but this is the solitary oak leaf miner, the gregarious oak leaf miner, the oak tentiform leaf miner. There are lots of species of, of moths that mine leaves. It's another strategy for getting around that oak leaf toughness. August is also a very dangerous time to be a caterpillar on, a, on an oak because that's when the populations of the predators that eat those caterpillars uh, reach their, their peak. This is a potter wasp, a eumenid potter, potter wasp that has just stung a uh, yellow striped oak worm. And that's why it's stiff as a board here. The oakworm is paralyzed. It's not dead, but it's paralyzed. Uh, and this is the equivalent of, of putting a slab of meat in the refrigerator uh, that you're gonna feed your kids. The, um, the potter wasp will fly back to its little, little mud pot and it will stuff this guy inside and then lay an egg on him. So he's alive, he's not rotting like uh, he would if he were dead. Uh, and he'll stay alive. And then the egg hatches and actually eats him while he's alive. But it's the, not such a nice way to go, but it is uh, a perfect way to have fresh, fresh meat 
uh, when you don't have access to a refrigerator. This is a, an egg mass of the yellow neck caterpillar. Um, gregarious, they're all laid together, but within minutes of the uh, adult female laying these eggs, you get a tiny little egg parasitoid, this tiny little wasp right here showing up, laying its own eggs inside each one of these eggs. And when they emerge, and they do, you see that they hit an awful lot of those, those eggs. So that, those are the natural enemies that help reduce the number of caterpillars on your, your oak tree. That's why you don't want to spray. There's also other, other enemies. This is a tachinid fly. Uh, it's a huge family of flies where these guys are also parasitoids. They lay eggs. It's a little white tachinid egg on the outside of caterpillars. This is a saddleback caterpillar. That egg's going to hatch and burrow into the caterpillar and eat him alive. Here's a tachinid larva that's already inside the caterpillar. That's its breathing tube on the outside. And this is a tiny little pteromalid wasp that is laying eggs in the uh, saddleback caterpillar. So this guy is dead three times over. Uh, and that's the way it is for most caterpillars by the end of August. Very, find a, very hard to find a caterpillar that has not already been parasitized. Here's a contracted Daytana caterpillar eating oaks, but it's got four tachinid eggs laid on it. This one is already hatched. These three are getting ready to, and they burrow into the caterpillar and they will kill it. This caterpillar, the black botch caesura, has figured out that um, a good strategy to avoid tachinid parasitization is to put a decoration on your back that looks like tachinid eggs. Uh, so the fly comes and says, uh-oh, you've already been parasitized. I won't lay another egg on you because then my, my young won't survive. A good strategy seems to work. Um, another way that caterpillars try to escape their enemies is if they feel the leaf vibrate, somebody's coming, they they parachute down on a silken thread. This guy is hanging by a thread. We can't see it here. And they just wait until the, the danger passes. Then they'll, they'll crawl back up and start eating again. But there are uh, wasps, particularly in the family Burconidae, that have figured this out. They'll take their first pair of legs and actually hand over hand, they'll pull that, that thread up and lay an egg in the caterpillar. Or other species will shinny down the, the little silken rope and uh, lay an egg in the caterpillar while it's hanging from its, its, its rope. So it's a very dangerous time to be a caterpillar on an oak tree. August is also the time that you're likely to see two types of plant hoppers, one in the family uh, Flatidae, they look like this, and one in the Acanalineidae, uh, pretty similar. Uh, but they can be quite numerous. This is what their nymph looks like. Uh, looks like who knows what, from something from outer space humpbacked and it's got this excuse me this flocculent wax coming at its rear end um, that's uh, a, a anti-predator device if an ant comes up behind it it gets a mouthful of wax and it doesn't taste very good but again these guys look bizarre and they get could get quite numerous on your oak branches people get upset what can i do about them don't do anything about them. Enjoy the, they look pretty. I mean, they're just part of the fauna, part of the, the uh, creatures that depend on oaks uh, and they're not hurting your tree at all. Okay, September, this is our final month, uh, but this is the time we get creek, uh, pick, peak cricket populations. You know about the black crickets on the ground. Uh, if one gets into your hearth, it's a good luck. Uh, but there are a couple types of crickets that get up into trees. We call them bush or tree crickets. They're either green or brown. Uh, and you may not know about them. They have a very clever uh, strategy, which is very similar to the, the uh, katydids. Remember, they're, they're here to, to reproduce. And the males are trying to attract females. So it's the males that sing. Why is it the males that sing? Because it takes a lot of energy. Uh, to sing. And the male is always going to do what takes more energy because it takes a lot of energy for the females to lay eggs and they want to save the energy for egg laying. So the singing falls to the male, but these guys are clever. They want to sing the loudest because the female is going to go to the male that is singing the loudest. So they cheat. They find a hole in a leaf, they stick their head through it and then raise their wings and they sing and it forms like a, a parabolic um, magnification of the sound, particularly if the leaf is, is cup shaped, it projects that sound out and makes this guy sound a whole lot louder than he really is. There are even some species that will snip a hole uh, the perfect size themselves and sing within that hole. It's also the time that you uh, might find walking sticks, and these are phasmin walking sticks. They're called walking sticks because they look like sticks and they walk. This is a walking stick on an emery oak in California. It looks very much like a hollow leaf, holly leaf, but it is an oak leaf. 
these guys spend their uh, the entire summer up in the canopy of our oak trees. Um, and we don't see them very often, but in the fall, September, maybe early October, uh, some, they, they do start to come down, particularly if any of the leaves have fallen, they'll fall down with the leaves. And that's when you're likely to encounter them. Occasionally, and it has not happened in my lifetime, but there are reports of walking sticks getting so numerous, particularly in West Virginia, that they actually cause some defoliation in oak forests. We'll see, I've never seen that. Uh, it's actually a treat to see one of the, at least one of these each, each summer. Okay, we've made it through the year. Those are just some of the things that are involved with our, our oak. I don't have to remind you people that, that we humans have created a, what we're calling a biodiversity crisis. You keep reading headlines, the birds are disappearing, the insects are disappearing. They're not disappearing, we're killing them. We're killing our birds. We've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's almost a third of our breeding bird population. We're killing our insects. We've got global insect decline, which is a problem because insects are the little things that run the world according to E.O. Wilson. And the earth is now experience its six, experiencing its sixth great extinction event. But this is the first one that's caused by another species. That's us as opposed to an asteroid or something else. So it's a global crisis, but the good news is it does have a solution. It's a grassroots solution, and the solution is you and me. We each one of us can turn this around if we if we recognize our responsibility in good earth stewardship. There are four things that every landscape where we live and work and play um, should be accomplishing every day. It should be capturing carbon. We've got too much carbon in the atmosphere. We've got to pull it out of the atmosphere, lock it up in plant tissues, and the plants will then pump it into the ground with their roots. We've got to manage our watersheds because everybody lives in a watershed. Nobody has the ethical right to destroy that watershed. It's plants that manage the watershed. We need to support a diverse community of pollinators. Why? Because pollinators pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. Forget the agriculture argument. It's about keeping 90, 80 to 90 percent of the plants on the planet around. We can't lose our pollinators. And we have to support a complex food web that supports all the animals that run the ecosystems that produce the, the, the life support systems services, those ecosystem services that keep us alive. That's what every landscape has to do. When you plant an oak tree, your oak does three of those four things better than any other type of tree. It captures more carbon. It manages the watershed better because of its huge root system. It supports a more complex uh, and, and um, abundant food web than any other tree genus. The only thing it doesn't do better than other plants is support a diverse community of pollinators because it's wind pollinated. But planting a tree that does three out of the four things we need to do on each piece of land uh, is, is a pretty good first step. Despite all these, these wonderful landscape attributes, our oaks are in, in trouble. The old giants are gone for the most part. We got a few here and there, but they used to be everywhere. The percentage of oaks in our Eastern forest has been cut in half. Uh, and I've heard about you know, some, some things in R Rhode Island where they're cutting down oak forests to put up solar panels, which makes absolutely no sense at all, since the, the oak forests are sequestering the carbon and put the solar panels where we don't have any, any forests. Um, the 28 of our 91 North American oak species are threatened, and one third of the global oak species are endangered because of the way we treat our landscapes. The Oregon white oak used to have a huge distribution from Southern California all the way up into Washington. It's lost 97% of its range due to agriculture. In Great Britain, the oaks are threatened, and there are 2,300 species that rely on oaks that are threatened as well because of the loss of oaks. And you've heard what's happening with Notre Dame Cathedral. They're rebuilding the roof out of French oaks. The 6,000 large oaks in France are being harvested to rebuild the roof of a single building. That's probably the last ones that, that are there. We humans live out our lives uh, during a very brief instant of ecological time. So we can't return those, those huge ancient oaks during uh, that time period, but we can start the process. And in no time at all, the oaks that we plant today will be large enough to fully assume their keystone positions in our yard. They don't have to be 400 years old to do that. We are all responsible for good earth stewardship. Why? Because we all depend on the quality of earth's ecosystems. So why would any of us uh, not, not be responsible for good earth stewardship? The best way to, to uh, exhibit that stewardship is to embrace the power of oaks. So when you plant a young oak, 
you're 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 creating a zoo. You're you're supporting the turkeys and the chickadees and the the red belly woodpeckers. You're supporting the magnolia warblers and the jays and the thrushes. You're supporting the the emeralds and the prominence and the gall makers. You're supporting the weevils, the orthopterans, the crickets. You're supporting a, a host, hundreds and hundreds of, of species that weren't in that space before you planted that oak. So plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. Thanks very much. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Welcome. I think we're ready for a Q and A, Amy. I'm good. We have lots of questions for you, Doug. <laughs> Great. All right. So um, the way we like to moderate Q and A with PCL Reads, which makes us so special, is if you would like, you may unmute and ask your question for Doug. Um, so you can say, you know, hi, Doug, and meet the author personally. Um, and we have first up in the chat, we have Janet Harrison. So Janet, would you like to unmute and ask Doug your question? And if you don't want to, I can read it for you. Okay, so Janet is asking Doug, how do Jay's access acorns in frozen ground? Do they check how hard the ground is and then move on if it's too hard? You know, Janet, I have wondered the same thing. <laughs> uh, they don't put the acorn very, very deep beneath the, the soil. Um, it's only like a half inch down and their, their beaks are pretty hard. So maybe they just hammer away at it, but it's a good question. And I really don't know if that, if that acorn is frozen solid in there, they're not going to be able to get it, but, but they do. So Good question. I, I will look into that. Uh, there, let, somebody asked me something I can answer. Though. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, Nessa Nessa Richmond has a question. Nessa, would you like to unmute? Hi. Sure. Um, we have a really big oak tree in our backyard, and I'm wondering if it's better to have it pruned um, to get the dead parts taken off, or if it's better to just let the dead parts stay on from an ecosystem perspective. It's definitely better to let them stay on from, from an ecological perspective. Uh, we prune things uh, mostly for, for looks, for aesthetics. Um, the tree surgeon will tell you, well, you know, it can be dangerous if you have a large limb, you're walking under it. And, and it can be if it's in a space where you're walking a lot. But, you know, of course, in nature, branches die. And each those dead branches are harboring a lot of living things. That's where the, uh, that's where the woodpeckers will, will carve out wood. Uh, I think we have 80, 82 species of birds in North America that are cavity nesters, and they depend on, on stags or dead material to make those, those cavities in and nest in them. If we always are taking down dead trees or, or carving out the, the dead branches, uh, we, we deprive them of that opportunity. So I would say if you have the option of, of not hiring that tree surgeon and just letting, letting them go, you're going to support a lot more life, but it's a it's a personal choice, and uh, I'll still talk to you if you if you if you prune your oak. Thank you, Nessa. Next up, we have Jody. Jody, did you want to unmute and ask your question? Oh, a sec. Hi, thank you so much for an incredible event and talk. I have two questions. Um, I find the word mast year a curious word. I'm wondering why is it called a mast year? <laughs> and I'm also, you've made me, I mean, we have tons of oaks and trees here. I'm just, if you had paper wasps building a nest outside your front door. I do. <laughs> so what would you do? So the mast year and the wasps. Yeah. Okay, mast year. Well, that's a second question I can't answer. I don't know why it's called a mast year. I'll have to look into that as well. <laughs> I'm sure there's a reason. Um, the paper wasps, 
you, you know, you can, you can, this is a good time of year. The, the nests are small. You can get a jar at night, put it right up over the nest and break it loose and put the top on and then put it in the freezer and, and you're done with them. Um, but wasps are, are important predators that, that uh, belong here. I do have one. I've got one over two doors, as a matter of fact, and I've had them for a couple of, couple of years. Uh, they always seem to pop up there. We just ignore them and we haven't been stung yet, but it, it does happen. I remember the day we moved into uh, this house that I showed you a picture of my son, who's a little bit taller than me by about five inches. Uh, he was carrying furniture in and he gets stung right in the top of the head. So yeah, you know, you, you don't have to, you don't have to leave them, um, but do it at night because you don't want to kill them during the day. They're out foraging and the ones that were out when, when you killed them, they're going to come back and they'll be upset with you. So thank you. We're I'll try to find out what, how, where the word mass came from. We're giving you homework today, Doug. Oh, you sure are. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, Sue Dunn has a question. Would you like to unmute? Uh, drought affect a mast year or growth years. We've had many years of drought here in Rhode Island. We're in good shape now, but it did affect a lot of our oak trees for years. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the mast that we had in 2019, it was huge. It went from Massachusetts all the way down to Georgia and all the way west to the Mississippi. Uh, and there were definitely different weather conditions over that huge area, yet they, they synchronized anyway. Um, so it's not simply uh, um, a, a good, good weather year, but a bad weather year can ruin a mass. So if it freezes when the, um, you know, if you have a late freeze when the catkins are hanging, uh, that'll, that'll ruin it. If you have a lot of rain when the catkins are releasing their pollen, that, you know, Wind pollinated things don't do well in rainy weather. Um, and of course, drought uh, will decrease the productivity of the tree overall. So they, that would be a, a, a situation where they probably don't have enough energy to produce all the, the acorns they want to, and they would uh, just kind of wait it out and, until they get enough rain again. So, um, so yes, weather certainly can inhibit a, a mast. It, 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 people say it helps synchronize it, but uh, again, I just don't understand how you can synchronize things from Massachusetts to Georgia because you don't have the same weather all over the place. So. Thanks, Sue. Uh, next we have up Carol. Carol, did you want to unmute and ask your question? Oh, thank you. You can ask it. Oh, okay. Um, Carol wants to know if are any of these smaller oaks native plants? Oh, they're all native plants. I will not recommend a non-native plant. If we've got 91 species of native oaks, why do we need to plant the Chinese oak or the English oak? Um, those oaks will not produce as many insects because our insects are not adapted to eating non-native plants as well. Um, so oaks are closely related. They even hybridize. They protect themselves in similar ways. So an insect that's adapted to eating tannin on oaks will be able to eat the tannin, or, you know, the leaves of, of many different oaks. Um, but I can, I look around, we've got Quercus sagittarius here. That's the sawtooth oak from China. It's actually an invasive species because people plant it everywhere. Now it's spreading all over the, the world. Um, very few, you look at those leaves, there's nothing eaten from them. So there's something in, in that Chinese oak that's discouraging our caterpillars. So, yep, stick to the native ones. It, I mean, I, I won't say if you can, because you can. There, <laughs> if you go to your nursery and they only have non-native plants, say, I want this particular native, please get it for me. And if they say, well, we're not gonna, say, okay, goodbye. Go to a nursery who will, because um, they, you know, it, it's a growing market and we need to, to train the nursery business that this is a growth industry and they need to start, um, it's not a short-term fad. We need to supply these plants and, and they're, they're catching on, they're doing that, so. Elizabeth Soros, would you like to unmute and answer, uh, ask your question? Leading up um, a pollinator, um, native plant pollinator alliance group in our specific town. And one of the things that we have heard 
about um, pollinating insects is that they need pollen, especially uh, the early emerging ones in spring and you know June months. And we've gotten recommendations about certain plants that provide that, um, but they're rare and far between, at least here in New England for the early months for pollen. Um, and I was just wondering why not oaks? Like why can't these insects or do they, do they rely on them for pollen um, in the early, in, in these summer months? I haven't heard that oaks provide that source for them, but I'd be interested to know what you. Well, oaks are dropping their catkins in uh, when in late April, I think. So it's early. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, there, there are more and more records of early spring bees using oak pollen as food. They're not transferring the pollen. They're not pollinating, but they are going to the catkins and getting the pollen. So apparently it's a more important source than we, than we ever thought. We just said wind pollinated and didn't even look. Should have looked because I think it's, it's important. Um, you know, a very good early, early uh, spring plant would be willows. They're the first thing out. Um, those pussy willows, perfect for your, your early spring bees. But not only do they need them in the spring, they need them all summer long and even, even into October. So um, yeah, providing the pollen all season long is the biggest challenge for a pollinator garden. But, it, you know, it's going to be a hard sell to say, I want oaks for my pollinator garden. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so oaks really don't, they're not a great source of pollen for those pollinators. I was hoping that because there just seems so, there, there doesn't seem a lot of pollen sources for them. And I thought, well, why not oaks? Like, why haven't they involved with oaks? Yeah, they produce yeah. So much? But I guess it's just, there just haven't been enough records of the bees using it for me to say it's a really important um I have seen, I've seen andrenids on oak, oak catkins, and there's a picture of one from someplace else, but the, the reports are pretty, pretty rare. Um, so. Thank you. Yep. All right, next up we have uh, Jeannie. Did you want to unmute and ask your question? Hi, Doug, thank you so much for tonight. And I just had a question about planting other species near the oaks. Um, if there are any that, any trees that would be happy growing up next to oaks and what should we choose? Okay, uh, in the east here, most of our oaks uh, prefer and actually generate fairly acidic soil. So things that like acid do well. Uh, so our native azaleas do really well under oaks. Our, our blueberries do really well under oaks. And when I say well under oaks, um, all of these things, particularly blueberries, are things that you want to flower and fruit, want sun. So you want them out near the edge of the, the uh, canopy spread. Uh, if you put them in deep shade, they will grow, but they, won't, they probably won't flower and fruit. Uh, so matching up the, uh, you know, the acidity of the soil is important. But uh, those things that do uh, well under the shade, that includes all of your, your uh, spring ephemerals. You know, there's a, just a, the, at least a dozen plants that uh, bloom early on, your, your bloodroot and Jack in the Pulpit and all of those guys. And the reason they can bloom well in shade is because they, they uh, grow and bloom before the leaves are even out. Uh, so in that case, your, your oak is not shading them yet. So you can have a very effective uh, spring ephemeral garden under oaks as well. I've got, I've got viburnums. I've got viburnum dentatum under, under my oaks. Uh, the oaks have grown out over them and now shade them so much that they're not blooming. I didn't plant them far enough out from the base, but, but they grow fine. Let's see, thank you. We have Patty Scott. Would you like to ask a question? Patty says, um, I assume that you don't use any pesticides on your lawn and yard. 
Oh, fertilizers. Your cookies are incredible. You, you are correct um, for two reasons. I'm too lazy. <laughs> they're not necessary. They're, they're simply unnecessary. Um, so I don't. OK. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Uh, next up, we have Michelle King Green. Did you want to unmute and ask your question? Oh. Michelle, you're still muted. Almost there. Michelle's using a phone that might affect. Yeah. Uh. Michelle, we can't hear your audio, so I'm going to read your question for you, OK? Um, Michelle asks, at what point in your career did you decide that educating the general public directly about the necessary need for native plants, including oaks, was something that you were going to pursue? Well, that's a good question. You know, it all started with moving into our house in, in 2000. And uh, what I didn't tell you is that, you know, it was mowed for hay, but when you mow for hay in this, this part of the world, you're really mowing all the invasive rootstocks, multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and all that stuff. And you call it hay. So when, they, when we built the house and they stopped mowing, that's what came back. We had 10 acres of, of invasive plants from China. Uh, so that experience, getting rid of them, looking at what it did to the food web, um, and then noticing that the public seemed to care about that is what changed me. I spent most of my career studying insect behavior, uh, but uh, this turned out to be the first thing that people actually cared about, and it turned out to be a very important thing. I didn't realize how many invasive plants there were. I didn't realize that 82% of the plants we use in our, our landscapes are from Asia. I didn't realize that our birds were all declining. I didn't realize the insects were declining. And you put all that together and you say, we've got to do something about this. But that all started in the year 2000. And um, it wasn't planned. It just happened. You know, I wrote Bringing Nature Home in 2000. I wrote it in 2005. It came out in 2007. It was an exercise uh, people I was talking to said, you know, would you write something about this? I finally said yes, but I didn't think anybody would read it. So I really thought that'd be the end of it and I'd go study behavior again. But people did read it and <laughs> they're still reading it. And it's the timing is right that people hear all these, these very scary headlines. Uh, and my message is you can do something about it. And that, that excites them because they don't want to feel powerless. They want to be able to do something. Um, so, and then, you know, restoring our own property. We, you know, we've got, what, what did I say? 1,090 species of moths. That's 40% of all the moths that occur in all of Pennsylvania on one 240 thousandths of the land mass, which means, you know, you really can rebuild the diversity. All you have to do is put the plants back. So it's it's all positive feedback that keeps me going and keeps the public going. But I stumbled into it. It was all an accident. It wasn't a great plan. So those are the best accidents happen. I guess. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Doug and Michelle. Uh, Michelle, that was my favorite question that came up. <laughs> I, I like people's stories. Uh, next up, we have Maud. Maud, did you want to unmute and ask your question? Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you. I was also quite inspired by bringing nature home and it made me do a lot of uh, rethinking about my gardens in Rhode Island. Um, my question is, I wonder, has there have there been any like invasive bugs identified uh, to the oak? Uh, and I, I asked this because of I wouldn't want to lose oaks like we've lost uh, chestnuts to a blight or something like that. I was just wondering yeah. if there had been any studies done about some nasty things occurring to our beautiful oak trees. Thank you. 
there are a lot of nasty things occurring to our beautiful oak trees. Gypsy moth, for one. I mean, that, there's an invasive caterpillar. When I say we need insects, I am not talking about non-native insects that become invasive. The gypsy moth and the, the brown tail moth and the satin moth and the, the um, what's the other one from England? These guys are over here without their natural enemies, without their diseases. There's no natural control. So they explode uh, and defoliating oaks is common. Oaks can take a little bit of defoliation, but two or three years during a drought year and it'll kill them. Um, so it's a, it's a very serious problem. We've also brought over a number of diseases, Southern Oak Death Syndrome and bacterial leaf scorch and oak wilt are taking a heavy toll on, on our oaks. So it's, it again is a very serious problem. But let me, let me, most people say, well, okay, stop planting oaks because they're gonna get sick. I say just the opposite because if we, what we need to do is find resistance to these things. The chestnut blight came and took out all of our chestnuts, but you know what really took it out was the loggers. They saw the chestnuts dying, so they logged every chestnut in the east. And the one or 2% of chestnuts that may have had some resistance were logged too. So what we want to do is find resistance to these different diseases uh, and, and you know, favor those. And actually the way the blue jays sprayed the acorns, it does it naturally because only the, the trees that are not sick make a good acorn crop. And those are the ones that the jays will, will plant. Um, so, so right away you get a disease resistance selection if we keep these, these trees in our landscape. But if we stop planting oaks or if we take them all down because we think they're gonna get sick, uh, we'll lose that opportunity and we don't wanna do that. So plant as many acorns as you can. Thank you. Um, Kimberly wants me to ask uh, you a question, Doug. Um, in regard to dead limbs, if they are removed because of the risk uh, they will fall, will it help to leave them somewhere to the side for animals to use? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, it's called coarse woody debris. Normally they would fall to the forest floor and they would be there. Uh, and that, that uh, first of all, that returns the nutrients that are in, in that limb. It also provides a, a safe site for a number of creatures like your salamanders. They live under those big, big branches. Um, it's also a, a, a site where a number of our, our bees uh, nest. They tunnel into like things like the carpenter bees, the big carpenter bee, the little carpenter bee, uh, and a number of the species carve out little holes in, in dead and pithy wood. And that's where they pack it with pollen and reproduce. And when we clean up our landscapes and take all of that stuff away, then all of those things uh, have, have no place to live. So, yep. Of course, woody debris is, is a necessary part of our, the, the ground ecosystem. Now, I, you know, I get it that we can't do that in the front yard, but we probably can do it in places in the backyard and, and get away with it, so. Thank you. Uh, so Janet Harrison, I'm gonna ask you to unmute again because you, you have a lot more questions for Doug, it looks like. Sorry, which, which question is, I had so many questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> just pick one, it doesn't matter. <laughs> which, which one, I, I, I just had, I had, oh, several. Which one, which one do you think, uh, which one was it, sorry? Um, I'm trying to find it again here. I know you had a lot. And any that, that don't get answered, I can always forward on to Doug as well. Uh, um, I'd like to know which birds like to eat gypsy moth caterpillars. I know they're very hairy with their CD. Um, are there, is that a put off for the adult um, parental birds to feed their young um, because they're so fuzzy? Yeah. Um, Most birds do not like hairy caterpillars. It's an excellent defense. I actually can't figure out why all caterpillars aren't hairy because it does keep the birds from eating them. <laughs> But the yellow bill and black bill cuckoo are specialists on hairy bill, hairy caterpillars, oh. and they will actually follow gypsy moth populations um, because the hairs get dislodged and, and uh, line the esophagus and the stomach of, of birds, and they don't like that at all. But the, the cuckoos have the ability to throw that up, and they, they renew their, their esophagus lining and stomach lining periodically. 
Uh, so they, you know, they've got an unlimited resource with uh, not just gypsy moth, but the tent caterpillar and the fall webworm. These hairy guys that other birds won't touch are are there for the taking. And and the other one was I remember. Um, uh, I know earthworms are invasive because uh, the we we've had um, the glacial effect of wiping out earthworms ten thousand years ago, um, and they're eating their way through our deciduous forests. Our oak tree, oak leaves, I know because of the three year, they're, they're much tougher and stream insects, just aquatic stream insects absolutely will use those as, as a last resort and, and would like the nice um, sweet maple leaves and apple leaves and everything else. Um, are they a discouraging factor for earthworms at all? Um, yes, they are, but you need to specify which earthworms you're talking about. You know, lumbricus? Brought... lumbricus uh, I, I'm thinking the ones that are the, the really huge ones, not the red yeah. wigglers that people use in their compost. We brought them over from Europe uh, a long time ago, and they've actually played pretty nice with our, with our ecosystems. They don't wipe out all the leaf litter. Um, they kind of blend it in uh, without causing big disruptions. It's the it's those wrigglers, those small little red ones from Asia in recent years that are that are wreaking havoc. They eat all the leaf litter. They change the soil chemistry. They eat all the seeds that are in the soil. Um, so they're a huge problem. But you're absolutely right. The only thing that seems to slow them down is oak leaf litter because they don't like it. So when you have a good oak forest with good heavy oak leaf litter fall, you typically do not have those Asian invasive, invasive worms. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I just wondered about that because my whole backyard is all oak leaf because I have a 125 year old white oak on one side and same age on uh, red oak on the other side and I'm sort of in the middle like a sandwich and I get leaf litter from both and I don't put it out at the curb I try to put them in bags and as much as I can put out there but not to be five feet deep right um and I see all kinds of moths and things rustling around in there and I'm really um I'm really chuffed I love to see that kind of activity in there and I see robins like swishing their bills back and forth trying to find caterpillars and mm -hmm. and yeah. other kinds of things so yeah, yeah I just yeah. wanted to know how much you know with oaks leaves okay great yes they're great thank you thanks Janet Okay, it looks like we have time for, we'll do one more question. Uh, Francis, it looks like your hand is raised. Did you have a question for us? We can unmute you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, you've already kind of asked, answered my question. It was more about the brown tail moth, uh, which is such a scourge in Maine right now. Um, what can we do to, get rid of them, maybe just plant more oaks. Uh, yeah, it, it's, we create these problems and then think there's easy solutions. The invasive species problem, whether it's invasive plants or invasive insects, is a, is a it's just a really tricky problem. The best solution uh, is probably going to be a successful biocontrol program where you bring over parasitoids that actually control it. Uh, we have been unable to do that successfully with the gypsy moth in the last hundred years. The only thing that controls, there's two things that control gypsy moth very well. And one is a fungus that came here on its own. And when you have enough rain, it outbreaks and controls them really well. The other one is a virus, uh, the, the polyhedrosis virus that is specific to gypsy moths. And when you get very high densities, which defoliate the virus, the virus breaks out and controls them. But it's kind of late. You've already defoliated the forest and killed lots of lots of trees. Uh, the brown tail moth is is this is a bad year, and again, it's that drought that's that's encouraging it. Um, I don't know of anybody who's worked on uh, biocontrol for it, but this might stimulate. These are these are big programs. It takes at least ten years to get something approved. Uh, all kinds of studies takes a lot of money, and you need a lot of people asking for it. So what do we do? Got me. 
you don't bring them over to begin with, but you know, that doesn't help us now. So. Well, the New York times today was saying, you know, you just got to wear a mask and goggles when you go out, when you come in, you got to take yeah. off all your clothes and take a shower. You know? That's a little, that's an overreaction. Now, in, don't in hang a typical your way, outside. <laughs> in a typical way, that's overreaction, but um, do what you do, what you need to do. Thanks so Thanks. much, Doug. Um, you also got some fun uh, reactions that you should do something for children on YouTube and that maybe you <laughs> turn your, your, uh, your bug photos and everything into a sci-fi movie as well. So I think <laughs> okay, in my spare time, I will. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again, Doug. All right, uh, you're welcome. Thank you, you're welcome. Lee, for, for being the co-host in library this month and my ever always partner in crime. Um, I just wanted to, before everyone runs away, I wanted to go over our fun summer filled quarter of the next three months of PCL reads. And okay, I'm going to run away before you do that. Though, so. Okay. <laughs> All <laughs> right. Good so night, much, everybody. Bye. 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 So we have next month, we are reading Braden Sweetgrass, um, and that's going to be co-hosted by the Knight Memorial Library. So we're going to travel over to another library in South Providence. Uh, that's another wonderful nature book for all of you who enjoyed this one. You definitely want to join us for that one on July 12th. Um, and then we're going to have another author talk in August, on August 9th, with Marilyn Chase, um, who wrote a book on the artist, uh, Japanese artist Ruth Asawa. Um, so check out that information on August 9th, and that's co-hosted here by my library, my children's librarian. And in September, we're going to read a graphic memoir about um, a Vietnamese family and their immigration journey. And that's called The Best We Could Do. And that's on September 13th. So we shared, we'll be sharing all these emails with you. You can register. Keep joining us for some fun. So thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Good night, everybody.